Okay, um, it's just after seven, so I'm going to get started. Um, first, I'll just acknowledge that we are gathered on ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, I'll also acknowledge and thank uh, the Dean of the Law School, Dean Cameron, for facilitating this series and also um, the organizer, Elizabeth Sanford, for all of her hard work. Um, and also uh, thank you to the audience. Um, obviously can't do these without uh, an audience. So um, I've always had, uh, also I'm Jody Lazar, I'm an assistant professor here. That's my contact information. Um, I've always had an interest in the law as it relates to animals. Um, I've been teaching the Animals and the Law seminar here at the law school for two years now. And uh, the fact is that this is a really interesting time to talk about animal law. Um, people are interested, clearly. Um, governments are listening. And I'll talk a little later about uh, current changes on the uh, legislative landscape where animals are concerned. And it'll become very clear that uh, I think we're in some kind of uh, a, some kind of moment because change is not uh, only on the horizon; it's actually happening now, and that's all positive. Um, but there are also some problems here, and I'm going to talk about those um, as well. So, uh, a caveat: the usual uh, lawyer line. What I say here is my academic interpretation of uh, these questions. It's not legal advice. Um, I'll also add that animal law is really a vast field. Um, it's criminal law, but it's also provincial regulatory law. It's science and agriculture and food law. It's uh, comparative law to a certain degree. You know, we often look to other jurisdictions to see how things are done there. Um, so I'll tell you from the outset that I can't claim to be an expert in all of those things, um, that I'm still learning myself every day. Uh, but I will relay to you what um, I do know, and I'll try to answer any questions that come up later on. So what will I talk about tonight? Um, I tried to highlight in the poster um, the contradictory ways that we think about and relate to animals and how the law relates to animals. You know, on the one hand, we love animals, or many people do, and presumably most people in this room do. Uh, there are family members, and we're horrified when we hear um, stories of egregious cruelty. At the same time, also I'll add that people who eat animals uh, generally want to know that the animals were treated well. We care. On the other hand, the fact is that we use animals every day. Many people eat them. We lock them up in enclosures far from their natural habitats. We pay money to go and look at them, to, for them to, in some cases, we pay money for them to entertain us. So in circuses, for example, although this is happening less and less, and that's certainly a positive, in things like rodeos, which may seem irrelevant to Nova Scotia, but actually there was one here last spring. Um, in zoos and aquaria, places like Marineland and uh, the Vancouver Aquarium, and places closer to home um, as well. We use products, cosmetics, house cleaning products, medications that have been tested on animals. These are not typically painless procedures for the animals. Now, I don't plan to talk uh, much about animals as research subjects, but that's just one example, come on in, um, of how the law relating to animals does not necessarily map onto, I think, how most people feel animals should be treated and, uh, and protected. So what I want to do using uh, a couple of examples is bring this idea to light um, by talking to you about the different ways that humans um, interact with animals and how the law either does or does not protect them in those contexts. And I'll also talk to you about the changes on the horizon. And I'll do this in um, four parts. So my plan is to speak for about 45 minutes, maybe a little more, and then open things up to discussion. And the four things that I want to talk about um, directly are these. So first, animals as family members, and what the law says about them when um, families break down. I'll talk about cruelty laws, mostly uh, federal law, and how the law has the effect of distinguishing between companion animals and other animals. It's not express, we'll see that, but it's there. Um, I won't show any distressing images, but some of the incidents I'll describe briefly uh, are fairly graphic, so be warned. Um, I'll talk briefly about animals in agriculture, and here I'll talk mostly about the rules surrounding um, the transportation of uh, animals used in agriculture or farmed animals which are um, pretty much the worst in the developed world, at least uh, from the perspective of the animal's interest. And then I'll talk uh, about the changes um, happening now. 
Um, I'll add, there are a lot of things that I'm not talking about. Again, animal law is a really wide subject. I couldn't possibly be comprehensive in less than an hour. So again, I won't talk about animal testing other than when I discuss current bills in Parliament because one of them relates to that. I won't talk about captivity, again, except insofar as that's affected by, uh, by one of the bills. In fact, the law around um, certain types of captivity is, is poised to change. Um, and I'll be brief on agriculture because it's a huge topic, it's a complicated topic, um, and it's not something I can really do justice to in, um, in this time. And again, all that said, I will try to answer whatever questions you have um, during the question period. Okay, so I'll get right to part one now, which is companion animals or animals that we consider part of our family. So first, some context. Um, estimates put the number of Canadian households that have companion animals at around 60%. So that's pretty big. Um, in terms of dollars, Canadians spend around $8 billion a year on their household pets. Um, and that number comes from a study relied on uh, recently by the Canadian Veterinary Association. So I think it's fairly safe that, uh, to say that Canadians care about their animals. Now that 60% um, that doesn't take into account uh, marital or family status, but the fact that so many families um, include dogs or cats um, and other types of animals as well, because they're so popular in Canadian families, they're going to become an issue when families break down, when couples get divorced or split up if they're not married. And in many cases, that means that the law is going to get involved just like it does for all other kinds of family property, because animals are, in fact, property. So if anyone here is wondering why I have a picture of a chair next to a picture of a dog, in the eyes of the law, your dog, or your cat, or your pet lizard, or animal of choice, is the equivalent of your chair, or your couch, or your fridge. I'm sure some people here know this, others maybe not, um, and when people when people hear this for the first time, they tend to be quite surprised. It's uh, off-putting, I think, to think about your animal um, as a thing, right? As garnering the same uh, legal protection and treatment as uh, your kitchen table, at least where property law is concerned. So what does this mean when um, families part ways? Well, the divorce rate in Canada hovers around 40%. Um, and as we saw, about 60% of families have a companion animal. The divorce rate, of course, does not include couples that are not married who split up, so people in a relationship or common-law spouses. Um, so again, it's not uncommon that a dog or a cat or what have you might get caught up in a dispute between a separating couple. And what should happen uh, with those animals when people can't work things out on their own following a breakup? That really depends on, um, depends on who you ask, because there are quite varied opinions on this from the legal system and more specifically from judges who are most relevant for our purposes here. Because when things go south following a breakup, that's where things ultimately are going to wind up. When they can't be worked out, they'll, your issue will land in front of a judge. So what judges think about this issue matters. Um, and again, those thoughts vary. So on the one hand, there is this view um, that this kind of thing, determining who gets custody of a dog, um, is a complete waste of court time and resources. And to be clear, the term custody doesn't actually apply because animals are property. Um, judges don't determine who gets custody of a dog or you know, an expensive car or a painting when a couple divorces. So the real issue here is about determining ownership of a dog. And uh, of course, this applies to other animals as well, but dogs tend to feature prominently in the case law. So I'll, I'll just refer to dogs uh, to keep it simple. So that's one end of the spectrum, and that's sort of a direct application of the principle that dogs are property, pure and simple, and subject to an agreement or an express transfer of ownership. The general rule about property ownership is the person that purchased the property is the owner of the property. That's a little less straightforward with respect to family property, um, but generally, in the context of the divorce, but generally as a basic principle, the person who bought the dog is the owner of the dog. So judges at this end of the spectrum, with respect to animals, they might accompany their reasoning with statements like, dogs are not children, dogs are bought and sold for profit, we don't do a best interest of the dog analysis, like best interest of the child, 
um, that people should not be encouraged to use the courts for this kind of thing, to determine ownership of a dog. And that to ask a judge to make an order about ownership of a dog is as silly as asking a judge to make an order with respect to a particular set of silverware because one partner is particularly, particularly attached to it. And I use that example because that analogy was made in, uh, in one of the cases. Now, the property designation comes from um, legal precedents established centuries ago when we knew um, a lot less about animals' capacity to feel pain and um, develop emotional attachments. And there are people working to change that, but it's an uphill battle, and that's likely to continue for years. So the fact remains that animals are property. What's questionable about that reasoning, I think, um, and other judges think as well, which I'll get to, um, the problem with that thinking is that taken to its logical conclusion, that kind of reasoning suggests that litigation over inanimate objects like jewelry and china cabinets is also not worthy of the court's time. But the fact is, judges deal with this kind of thing all the time, right? There's case law about jewelry, about furniture, about artwork, about property, in other words, that people have a particular attachment to. Now, whether cases like that are, in fact, um, a great use of the judiciary's time is definitely a question worth asking, and one where there are probably strong arguments um, on both sides. A friend of mine practices family law, and we were discussing this, and she told me that she once spent two hours, billable hours, of course, um, negotiating over uh, bunnies and what would happen to those bunnies when, uh, where a couple broke up. So both her and the opposing lawyer were paid for two hours of their time to work this out. That's a choice that these people, these people made. Um, that was worked out without going in front of a judge, so good for them. Uh, but many similar issues are not, and the fact remains that that's what courts are for, to settle, settle disputes between citizens using reason and logic. So the idea that determining um, animal ownership is a waste of court's time may be questionable. Now that's one end of the spectrum. At the other end is um, the opposite view, that this is an important question, uh, that it's worthy of judicial resources, and that it should not necessarily be, be determined um, according to a straightforward property analysis. And this idea has also been recognized um, in the case law. So <clears throat> these cases don't um, deny that animals are property, but uh, I think rather that they represent a sort of a reasonable recognition that they're not the same kinds, that animals are not the same kinds of property, um, or not the same as other kinds of property. You know, they're not inanimate objects, they're, they're animals, they're sentient, and people have emotional attachments to and relationships, relationships with them. So this approach would look um, beyond who purchased the dog. So while it might take that into account as one factor for determining ownership, it would also look at other things, like who raised the animal, who uh, exercised care and control of the animal, who bore the burden of care and comfort for the animal, who paid the expenses associated with the animal. So vet bills, food, training, that kind of thing, that $8 billion that we heard about. And the idea here is that these factors recognize that ownership can change after an animal was acquired. So these factors come from a case, um, originally a small claims court decision in Nova Scotia in 2017, and last year in January, they were relied on by a justice of the Newfoundland and Labrador um, Court of Appeal in what I'm quite sure is the first um, appellate court decision to deal with ownership of a companion animal. So for those who don't know, um, appellate court decisions are uh, significant. They set the law for that province. Um, they're the last step uh, that a case goes to before the Supreme Court of Canada, which of course sets the law for the entire country. So it's neat to see an appellate court, a court engaging with this issue and taking it seriously. Now, unfortunately, um, those reasons didn't prevail in that case. So courts of appeal sit in, uh, in odd numbers. And the two other justices carried out a straightforward property analysis and granted ownership to the person who had purchased the dog. But the third justice, the dissenting judge, um, she disagreed. So she looked at the evidence and she found, in fact, that both parties owned the dog, despite that only one of them had paid for it, her, Maya. Um, 
looked at the evidence and, and determined that they were both owners based on their actions and on their individual relationships with the dog during the time that they were um, together. So she was not in the majority, which means that those reasons don't prevail. They're not the law for Newfoundland and Labrador as of now. But what's interesting here still is the recognition by a court of appeal justice of the importance of the relationship with the animal, even accepting that animals are property. So this recognizes, in other words, that animals are a distinct kind of property. They're not like a dining room table. So again, um, these reasons didn't prevail, but that doesn't mean that another court of appeal in another province might not adopt them in going the other way. Appellate court decisions are not strictly binding in other jurisdictions. So if and when this case does come up again, and it probably will outside of Newfoundland and Labrador, it's not um, beyond the realm of possibility, possibility to think that another judge uh, might pick up on that kind of reasoning and make it law in that province. Not guaranteed, but uh, certainly not impossible. So not an actual victory here for the woman who lost ownership of the dog, but a small victory nonetheless um, for those who believe that the law should, in fact, treat companion animals as different from uh, a bedroom set. And uh, to be frank, animals don't see many victories in the legal system, so this is significant and, uh, and hopeful. There's another takeaway here, I think, and that's... Um, even though I'm clearly of the view that this kind of question is fair game for a court, that it's not a waste of a judge's time to resolve this kind of dispute, there's still a risk in um, placing these cases before, before a court because there's a decent chance that a straightforward property analysis will apply. So if you and your partner get a dog together, you both cared for the dog together, maybe you cared for the dog more than your partner and things changed, and the relationship changes during the year since the year since acquiring the dog. Unless you bought the dog, you know, with your credit card or, or a check in your name, there's a good chance that as the law stands today, the ownership will go to your partner if they bought the dog. So placing this kind of thing in front of a judge, like any issue, really, um, but more so here because of the, the state of the, the majority of the cases, carries risks. Um, which means that it's a good idea, like in most family law disputes, to try to keep this, uh, this kind of thing out of court, to try to resolve the issue on your own, at least until the law, more broadly speaking, recognizes that there are or there may be other valid considerations than who originally purchased the dog. Okay, so if you have questions on this custody issue or ownership, I'll ask you to uh, either write them down or remember them. I'm going to move on to cruelty. So, it's a terrible picture, but as a general, um, it illustrates that as a general matter, animal cruelty um, at the federal level is governed by the Criminal Code of Canada, which as I'm sure most people here know, is a uniform law meant to apply uh, uniformly across jurisdictions, across provinces, and which defines the offense of animal cruelty. So this is the central provision dealing with, uh, with cruelty to animals. And basically what it tells us is that you commit an offense if you willfully cause, or if you're the owner, willfully permit to be caused, unnecessary pain and suffering, um, pain, suffering, or injury to an animal or bird. And you'll notice that I've bolded um, certain words in there. Because those words are really key to understanding um, how this provision works or doesn't work, depending who you ask. So those bolded parts, in other words, tell us who or which animals the provision is really meant to protect. Because there are some, uh, I suspect that there are some misconceptions out there about what the criminal code does and does not do uh, with respect to animal cruelty. So to put it uh, simply or bluntly, the criminal code prohibits gratuitous violence toward animals, the deliberate causing of pain and suffering unnecessarily or for no good reason, which means that it does not prohibit necessary suffering. So some examples, and I apologize, this is where it gets a little graphic. Skinning a cat alive, unnecessary. Beating a dog with a shovel, unnecessary. Taping a dog's mouth shut and leaving it in a dumpster to die, unnecessary. These are all from the case law. Uh, 
But practices related to pig slaughter, practices that cause pain and suffering, even in the presence of evidence of less painful ways available, necessary. And this really highlights, I think, the contradiction that I mentioned. The idea that we as a, as a justice system and as a society are willing to accept certain practices in certain contexts. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of uh, the particular practice that the judge in this case uh, found necessary, the cases from 1957, and the practice, uh, practices have changed since then. But it's still a leading authority on, um, on this question. It's one of the fundamental uh, cases that, that we teach in um, an animal law course for the purposes of understanding the uh, criminal code provision on cruelty. Because the court's reasoning here um, is still good law. And the reasoning goes where humans have a legitimate interest in something, here, eating pigs, causing them pain and suffering may be necessary. And this applies beyond slaughter as well. So what the case law basically tells us about this provision is not that it protects animals from cruelty, but rather that it protects or immunizes what we deem as necessary cruelty. And what's necessary depends a lot less on the treatment in question than on the animal's use. And that's basically a direct reading of the pig slaughter case, because the judge there tells us that if someone were carrying out these actions, the, the, the actions, the slaughter practice in the, in the case, um, if someone was carrying out these actions on a pig for no good reason, he says to hear it squeal or for any other sadistic reason, that person would be guilty of animal cruelty. So animal cruelty is really about use and much less about um, the act in question, which obviously tells us something about the kinds of animals that are going to be protected by the criminal law. So farmed animals, animals used in agriculture, not really. It's going to be exceptionally rare, an egregious case of cruelty, really, outside of the realm of accepted practice, that someone involved in agriculture, in agriculture will be charged criminally for animal cruelty. And this case um, is basically why. So dogs and cats, sure. But even that, is, even that is not so straightforward. So many of you may have heard Nova Scotia recently, about a year ago, or in the fall actually officially, um, banned cat decline, or non-therapeutic partial digital amputation. The thinking is it's painful and it's unnecessary. My rhetorical question for you is whether any, anyone was ever charged criminally for decline under the cruelty provision before this ban came into, into effect? And you can probably guess the answer, which is no, because it's an accepted medical practice. I'll, I'll just say, um, I, I can't say definitively no, I have not read every single cruelty case um, ever rendered in, in Canada, uh, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say no. Um, so the ban is great, uh, I don't wanna diminish that, it was, uh, Nova Scotia was the first place to formally do this, and it's long overdue. Other provinces have since followed suit. As of this past weekend, it's now prohibited in all of Atlantic Canada, which is great. Um, but I use this example to illustrate the weaknesses in the criminal law, because prior to the ban, if someone were charged under the criminal code with causing unnecessary suffering to a cat by declawing that cat, they could easily demonstrate that it's not, in fact, unnecessary it's a regular thing we do to cats for a legitimate reason, and there's no less painful alternative, which in fact there is. But the point remains the same criminal charges would probably not, um, would probably not succeed here. Okay, so I mentioned uh, willfulness and necessity. I haven't talked to you about uh, willfulness yet. So in the, in the leading decision interpreting willfulness or interpreting the willfulness requirement, uh, had to do with a cat. Um, the accused got mad at his daughter's cat. The cat's name was Sammy. It's rare that animals are named in, um, in court decisions. Often, actually, when, uh, when the judge starts naming the animal, you get a sense of where, where they're going to end up. Not true here. Um, <laughs> so Sammy knocked over a garbage can. There was garbage all over the kitchen floor. And in response to this, the accused chased Sammy around the house uh, with a broom. Sammy hid under the bed. The man swiped at him with the broom handle. And then Sammy spent the whole night in the furnace room, 
he wouldn't eat, and he didn't come out for a whole day. Eventually, the accused and his daughter, was his daughter's cat, um, took Sammy to the vet where he was x-rayed and diagnosed with a broken leg. There was no doubt that the accused has, has had caused the break, right? He admitted what happened at the vet. Um, he said that he swiped at the cat with the broom handle, and he made contact. Um, so this is obviously not a case of interpreting necessity. It's clearly unnecessary to uh, discipline a cat with a broom um, to break its leg. So this case turned on the willfulness requirement and um, whether the accused intended, in other words, to break Sammy's leg. And of course he didn't. The prosecutor couldn't prove that the accused had willfully caused Sammy unnecessary pain and suffering, so he was acquitted. Which effectively means that I didn't know or I didn't mean to um, can be a defense to a criminal charge of animal cruelty. So in other words, an individual accused of animal cruelty um, needs to have knowledge that their actions will probably cause unnecessary pain and suffering. All right, last thing I'm going to say about the cruelty provisions of the criminal code. So that's a fairly um, well-fed horse. Um, so not the best illustration of this case. I didn't take you through the criminal code provision on um, neglect, but there is one, and it's been interpreted in a very similar way uh, as the cruelty provision. So it too requires that neglect be willful, which in itself is an oxymoron and hard to wrap one's head around. That aside, the interpretation of the willful neglect provision of the code um, confirms this. It comes from a case uh, where someone's horses did not look like this. It's a case about the failure to feed one's horses. And basically what it tells us is that that requirement of willfulness, just like for causing unnecessary suffering, that here, with respect to neglect, it matters. So the authority on this case, on this, uh, on interpreting the neglect provision is a, a case from um, the Yukon, sorry, it's actually from Alberta. Um, the case is about a man who ran a tour company in the Yukon, and he had about two dozen horses. And at the end of tourist season in November, he brought his horses down to um, Alberta for the winter. Uh, in March, local farmers um, in the neighborhood started to become concerned about the condition of the horses, and they called the police. And as it turned out, three of the horses had died of starvation, and the rest were emaciated. So because of the weather, this was in Grand Prairie, Alberta, in the winter, most of the hay and the grass that was left for them was covered in ice, so they couldn't get to it. So there was no controversy that the horses starved and that their owner failed to provide suitable and adequate food. But don't forget, the offense requires that the neglect be willful. And here, there was no evidence that the accused intended to let his horses starve and die. So the evidence, in other words, didn't establish that he knew that leaving horses unattended in a pasture in northern Alberta for the winter would probably result in them going hungry. The court reasons that the loss of the horses would result in a serious financial loss to the accused, which he could not have willfully intended. And in coming to that conclusion, the court relies on evidence from a local vet to the effect that this kind of neglect and starvation of horses and other livestock is actually not that uncommon, which led the judge to conclude that it was not unreasonable for the accused to hold these misconceptions. So, to summarize, on the criminal code, the treatment has to be unnecessary. Accepted uses of animals are necessary. The treatment has to be intentional. And of course, because we're in the realm of the criminal law, uh, the offense has to be, the, the lack of necessity and the willfulness has to be, and the actual act, of course, has to be proven um, beyond a reasonable doubt by the Crown, by the prosecution, for charges to succeed, which is a high burden of proof um, for a good reason, because criminal charges are, are serious and uh, the consequences of criminal charges are serious as well. But what that means here is that there's not a lot of great stuff happening um, under the criminal code for animals. And where, ch uh, where charges under the code are successful, they're typically accompanied by uh, a light sentence. That's also changing, um, but people typically are not satisfied with, uh, with sentences under the criminal code. I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on sentencing, but the provision that we looked at 
I guess I can go back. Um, the punishment is set out there, and it provides for a maximum of five years in prison. Um, again, I haven't surveyed every single case decided under this. The, the sentence changed in 2008, um, but I'm fairly confident in saying that nobody has ever seen um, five years. Um, I think two years is the max, and uh, it's pretty rare. So a couple of years ago, um, an individual was sentenced to two years, followed by three years probation, and then a 25-year ban on um, having animals. So uh, I had mentioned this one. He pleaded guilty to taping a dog's muzzle shut, uh, binding its legs. Oh, this is different. And leaving it in a field to die. Um, what's interesting about the, this case is the sentence, certainly, it's high. But uh, in the news reports, the media talks about the fact that the accused or the offender, rather, because he pleaded guilty. It talks about the fact that he spent much of his time in prison, um, right from the time he was arrested, in solitary confinement for his own safety. The idea, of course, being that his crime was really egregious. The Crown called it a despicable act of depravity. So people care about this stuff, right? People care about animals. You hear about similar situations when children are victims, that, that accused or offenders have to go into solitary confinement because their crimes are so outrageous. But a lot of the same people, I think, don't quite know that the criminal law is not very effective at protecting animals, because the two-year sentence is really an exceptional case. Okay, so that was the criminal code, which is federal law. Provinces also have animal protection legislation. I'm not going to get into any real detail on the provincial law, but I will say that the same kinds of exceptions are built into those laws as well, more expressly than the criminal code. Most of the provincial um, animal protection laws actually uh, state, you know, who they do and don't apply to. Um, also, an increasing number of charges happen under provincial law. So I mentioned that um, Nova Scotia was the first province to ban deflying, that others have followed suit. That kind of thing happens under uh, provincial law. So these days, a lot of cases are being handled under provincial statutes and not under the criminal code. And it's easy to understand why, based on what I've just told you about the criminal code. Um, it's very difficult to prove willful, that somebody, someone willfully caused unnecessary pain and suffering. Provincial offenses are easier to prove, so the Crown's job is easier there. And they're also harder to defend because they don't carry um, the stigma of the criminal law. But that they don't mean the same thing as the criminal law, I think is also problematic. So I'm not generally in favor of a, a broad criminal law. I don't think we should be throwing more people in jail. I think there are plenty of people in prison who probably don't belong there. But the criminal law, I think, also has a message sending function. And I think that certain behaviors really do merit the, the symbolism of criminal sanction. Also, on a practical level, this matters. Um, provincial offenses, first of all, they don't create a criminal record. And second of all, an order accompanying a sentence under a provincial law, so for example, a prohibition on, a on um, owning animals you know, going forward, that prohibition is only going to be effective in that province. So what that means is that people convicted under a provincial law if they're really motivated to keep doing what they're doing, they can simply pick up and move. So you hear about puppy mill operators doing this. They're shut down in one province, they're fined, it's the cost of doing business, they move and set up shop across the border, and they continue to operate um, with the same problematic conditions and outcomes for the animals. So it's not great. All right, that's all I'll say about, <clears throat> about provincial law. I'm going to move briefly to animal law um, in agriculture. And here I just want to focus on um, one aspect of the Canadian agricultural industry that's particularly problematic. There's a lot more to say about the laws around agriculture and farming. Um, but the fact is, uh, as some of you may know, there really is not much law um, on the treatment of animals on the farm, at least insofar as their well-being is concerned. So there are lots of regulations about food safety, and some of those 
some of those laws, some of those regulations coincide or, or do or are conducive to um, animal interests as well. But where treatment of animals on the farm is concerned, um, instead of legislation adopted by our democratically elected leaders and debated in parliament, there's a series of codes of practices which are developed primarily by industry. I will say that these codes are better than the alternative. The alternative being no regulation or standards um, at all for the treatment of animals on the farm. And that was essentially the case prior to the early 2000s when these codes started to be um, developed. So the industry has taken um, an important uh, and positive step here. But the fact remains that it's industry itself that decides the rules, that sets the baseline for criminal or quasi-criminal conduct within that industry. And I don't want to say that there is no other area of law or life where that's the case. Maybe there is. But I will say that it's, it's quite an exceptional situation. Where the law does come into play with respect to animals um, in agriculture is surrounding transport, specifically transport to slaughter. And basically, uh, despite very recent changes here, these uh, 2019 regs were adopted in, uh, in February. Um, so despite those changes, Canada has, uh, I think it's safe to say that Canada has the worst animal transport world uh, rules in the developed world. The previous regulations prior to the 2019 regs um, had been in place since the late 1970s. Um, these current ones were adopted after a decades-long process of, uh, of review and development. And in short, they're, well, as you can see, they're not much better than the situation in the late 1970s. So this is uh, an adaptation of a chart published by the CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, who sets these regulations. Um, and it deals with maximum time limits that an animal can be um, on a truck without food, water, or rest. Um, and it's comparing them to the previous version. So cows, for example, uh, ruminants, can be uh, transported for up to 36 hours without food, water, rest, which is down from 48 hours under the previous rules. And just for the sake of comparison, so here's where the comparative element comes in. In the US, the maximum time for cattle is 28 hours. In the EU, it's eight hours. Um, yeah, OK, that's cows. Pigs, 28 hours down from 36, uh, which is a lot more than the eight hour maximum in the EU. Uh, baby chicks, so these are newly hatched birds, 72 hours before and currently as well. I understand that that's the amount of time that a chick um, can sustain itself without uh, food, rest, water. What this image doesn't tell us is the temperatures at which animals can be transported in open trucks on the highway. Uh, and those continue to go unregulated. Basically, they're at the operator's discretion. Um, and that's obviously significant in a place like Canada, where we have extreme weather, right? So something like minus 10 plus a wind chill is going to feel much colder on an open trailer moving at 100 kilometers an hour, um, let alone, you know, minus 15, minus 20, et cetera. And of course, extreme heat um, is going to feel much hotter when you're jammed in a truck full of warm bodies with no ventilation requirements. With respect to rest time, in Australia, rest times are 12 to 36 hours, so the amount of time that an animal must be rested before they can be loaded back onto a truck. Uh, 12 to 36 hours, depending on the species. In Europe, 24 hours rest for all animals. In Canada, eight hours up from five. So some will say that the science is divided, or somewhat divided, on, um, on this question. Um, about the science on stress and behavioral changes uh, associated with long transport times. But there seems to be some consensus uh, on the fact that the limits in Canada are simply way too long. There's also a strong consensus among um, Canadians. So according to data published last year, I think by the Globe and Mail, before these changes were made, eight out of 10 Canadians were in favor of shorter transport times to reduce suffering and uh, including protecting animals from extreme weather. So again, I'm not a scientist. I can't speak to the science. But what I can tell you is that according to the CFIA itself, 
Under the old regs, two to three million animals a year die during transport every year in Canada, and approximately seven million more are condemned upon arrival at slaughterhouses for being too um, diseased or injured to be fit for human consumption. So that's almost 10 million dead or condemned animals per year. And just for reference in Canada, we kill somewhere in the range of 600 million animals per year. The vast majority of them are transported. So those stats uh, on arrival at the slaughterhouse uh, are under the old rules. We don't have numbers yet under the new limits because they're new. Um, but they're not that much shorter. And uh, changing these was a decades-long undertaking. So I think these are unlikely to change for a while. All right. Last thing I'm going to talk to you about. So a lot of what I've said is not, uh, it's not super optimistic. Um, this is where things get a little better. So there are currently four bills in Parliament in Ottawa um, related to animal protection. And again, I have not done a study of this, but I have heard others refer to this situation as unprecedented. Uh, the thinking among, among animal advocates is that uh, animal issues have never been um, at the top of the uh, political agenda, so not much of a political priority. Um, but it looks like that may be, I'm going to say slowly, starting to change. So what I'll do um, for a few more minutes is talk to you about each of the ways that the federal, uh, the federal government is looking to change the law as it regulates our relationship with um, certain types of animals at the national level. And the first thing listed there is first, because it looks like it's really going to happen in terms of the legislative process. It's pretty close. So the bill in question, that's a beluga, um, is called the Ending the Captivity of Whales and Dolphins Act. It's often referred to in the media as the Free Willy Bill, or the, um, the uh, or actually called Bill S203. S because it originated um, in the Senate which means that once it goes through three readings in the House, it means it's made its way through the Senate, and once it goes through three readings in the House of Commons and then gets royal assent, which is more of a formality than anything else, um, it becomes law in the books. So the bill is limited in scope. It only affects certain animals. But I think it nevertheless has um, significant meaning in terms of what we as a society deem acceptable treatment and use of animals. And what this demonstrates is that the majority of Canadians just no longer think it's acceptable to hold certain marine mammals, dolphins and whales mostly, in captivity and force them to perform in the interests of economic profit. So the effect of the bill is to amend the criminal code. What it'll do is add another provision just after the, uh, the general provision on unnecessary pain and suffering. And that provision, it applies to cetaceans. So what it first does is define cetaceans as including whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And then it prohibits three things. It prohibits the keeping of a cetacean in captivity. So that's not going to be allowed in Canada anymore. It prohibits breeding or impregnating a cetacean. And it prohibits um, possessing or seeking to obtain reproductive materials of cetaceans, which is, of course, how they're bred. It also includes a couple of exceptions. Um, it will not apply to those already in possession of these animals. So that's Marineland and the Vancouver Aquarium. These are the only two facilities in Canada, in Canada that keep captive uh, whales uh, and dolphins. And you know, it's not the kind of thing we want to see, but quite frankly, it's not really easy to move these animals. And right now, um, there's nowhere to put them. Um, so these animals are grandfathered in. It also will not apply where an animal is being uh, rehabilitated in a, in a rescue re rehabilitation situation where captivity is deemed to be uh, in its best interest. Um, with respect to penalty, the sentence is a maximum of six months in prison uh, and or a fine of $200,000, uh, which is high, um, clearly meant to apply to businesses. Individuals don't typically keep these kinds of animals at home. And right, <laughs> the idea there being that the sentence needs to be something more than the cost of doing business, right? So there are two other small things that the bill does. It makes it illegal to move a wild cetacean for the purposes of taking it into captivity. And it requires an export permit um, in order to import or export a cetacean uh, or a tissue culture or an embryo. But my understanding is that Canada hasn't, um, hasn't actually issued an export permit or import permit for 
a couple of years now. So that's not a major change. But the, so that's the gist of it. Um, so it passed second reading in Parliament last year, uh, last week, sorry, after already uh, having gone through the Senate. Um, and for those who don't know, that means it's, it's pretty much poised to become law. So it would be provided it gets uh, on the order paper for third reading before the writ is dropped for the next election, which will happen soon. Um, that said, it would be pretty exceptional for a bill to be killed uh, on third reading, again, which is the final debate in the House before it becomes law, or before it gets royal assent and then becomes law. And again, because it, it originated in the Senate um, almost four years ago now, it's been a long time coming, uh, it doesn't need to go back and be studied there. And in fact, the Senate studied this, uh, the Fisheries Committee in the Senate studied the bill at, at 17 different meetings and heard from more than 40 witnesses, so experts in marine biology, animal behavior, fisheries, conservation, animal welfare, and more. So that's the whale and dolphin bill, or the free willy bill. Um, it's excellent news. As I said earlier, it's limited in scope, right? There are only two places in Canada that keep these animals. There's only one orca or killer whale in Canada. That's Kiska at Marineland, and she gets to stay. Um, but it's overall a positive for sure. Um, if, if anything at all, again, I think it's an important acknowledgement by our government, our elected representatives, that Canadians are not interested and don't support seeing these you know, very cute and uh, very intelligent animals uh, in the equivalent of a concrete bathtub and made to perform tricks for their food. So definitely worth celebrating. I'll spend a bit less time on the others. Cosmetics testing. This is Bill S-214. Also a Senate bill, passed third reading in the Senate um, in June of 2018. It's called the Cruelty-Free Cosmetics Act, and it amends the Food and Drugs Act, which otherwise regulates um, cosmetics, the sale of cosmetics, testing, that kind of thing. And uh, what it does is prohibit the sale of any cosmetic that was developed or manufactured using cosmetic animal testing. Um, so the sale of products and not just doesn't just prohibit the sale of products that have been tested, but it also prohibits the testing itself, and it prohibits the use of evidence or um, ingredients that have themselves been derived through um, by animal testing. So again, this passed in the Senate, uh, much less resistance than the the whale and dolphin bill, which uh, which faced uh, a lot of resistance um, from the conservative whip in in the Senate. Um, Unfortunately, this bill has not yet been introduced in the House of Commons, and I think with an election coming up quickly, it has less of a chance uh, of becoming law than the Well and Dolphin Bill. But it's not irrelevant. Uh, again, it's an acknowledgement that uh, certain practices are no longer acceptable to Canadians. This is also an example of the law really just following industry practice. It's consumer-driven. A lot of companies have already abandoned animal testing because people really just are not interested in buying cosmetics that have been tested on rabbits. Um, it's also, to a large degree, Canada keeping up to date with uh, developments internationally. So the EU, the UK, New Zealand, they all prohibit this. California is going that way as well. So again, the law uh, catching up to changing societal attitudes about what is and what is not acceptable conduct relating to animals. But there's also another lesson in here, which is that the law moves slowly, and this is a good example of that because I'm not sure that the bill that this bill will make it through the House before the election. Third bill is on bestiality and animal fighting. So that is a pit bull, which is the type of dog, pit bull, pit bull type dog, uh, type of dog that we typically associate with dog fighting. Um, so this, again, is an act to amend the criminal code uh, by doing three things. So first, it defines bestiality, um, which some people might find odd, and why is this a legislative priority? Uh, so in 2016, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, acquitted uh, an accused person of the offense of bestiality because the act in question did not include penetration. The uh, animal ad legal animal advocacy group, Animal Justice, um, which is which is that legal advocacy group for animals in Canada, they intervened in that case, which means they were given permission to make arguments uh, representing the animal's interests. 
uh, there was a dissenting judgment in the case, which uh, took up animal justice's reasoning. But ultimately, uh, the accused was acquitted. So this bill is an example of what we call dialogue theory between the legislature and the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court says the law is problematic, but it's not really up to us to fix it. So, you know, fix it. They don't say it in quite those words. But this is the legislature responding to the Supreme Court's reasoning. Um, basically an attempt to close that loophole by defining bestiality as any conduct for a sexual purpose with an animal. This bill also strengthens the prohibition on, um, well, dog fighting, but animal fighting um, more generally. So right now, the criminal code prohibits encouraging, aiding, or assisting, attending, at, uh, at the fighting or baiting of animals or birds, and the amended law would extend, would extend that prohibition to promoting, arranging, receiving money for, or taking part in. Um, it would also uh, prohibit training, transporting, or breeding of animals for those purposes. So a broader offense, um, showing again that uh, this is not the type of behavior that the Canadian public condones. The criminal code um, currently prohibits this is the third thing that the, the law do, the bill does. The criminal code currently expressly prohibits uh, cockfighting and the keeping of a cockpit. So the last change broadens that offense to include um, any arenas uh, for all animal fighting. Um, I don't know that this bill is going to pass before the election. Um, it has not yet passed in the House, and it's a House of Commons bill, so it's got to go through three readings in the House of Commons. And in um, the Senate, which I don't think we're going to see that happen before the election, so again, maybe not law yet, but again, sending important messages about what we deem acceptable and unacceptable about how the law and about how the law relates to animals. Last proposed ban on shark finning, on uh, shark fin import and export. So. Shark finning uh, involves the practice of removing fins from live sharks and discarding the remainder of the sharks while at sea. Not surprisingly, many are of the view that this is cruel. It, uh, of course, it's painful. Um, and aside from that, sharks can't properly function in the water without fins. They can't defend themselves um, from predators. So this effectively uh, condemns them to die. The products of shark finning, fins themselves, are typically used to make shark fin soup, which is considered a delicacy among certain cultural groups. Uh, shark finning itself has been banned in Canadian water since 1994, so what this bill would do is extend that ban to importing the products of finning from elsewhere. So a prohibition on import, subject to a permit, and a permit might be issued uh, for the purposes of scientific research that benefits um, the species in question. So this is not, uh, this is being billed not as a question of criminal law uh, or of morality, but of uh, fisheries and conservation based on what the bill calls the devastating effect of shark finning and the resulting decline in shark species in Canadian waters and around the world. So a question of species conservation and management. Um, this bill passed in the Senate, this is the Senate bill, in October 2018, and it's gone through first reading in the House, um, I think people are a little bit more hopeful that this one will get done um, before the election, but I don't have a, a magic eight ball, so we shall see. Um, but again, a statement um, about the importance of here, not so much a moral question, although certainly there are moral elements, but about ensuring the continued existence of certain threatened species. Okay. Um, so I've spoken for longer than I planned. I've barely sort of scratched the surface of current issues relating to the law's treatment of animals. Um, but I hope to have gotten my main message across, which is that in many situations, when it comes to the balancing of interests between human and non-human, the balance tends to tip in favor of humans. That said, change is happening slowly with respect to a narrow range of activities, but it's something. Um, as things stand right now, uh, in my view, in the view of others, the law doesn't do enough to protect animals, and that ultimately means that the responsibility 
falls on us as you know just members of the public but also as users as owners of animals whether as pets as food as entertainment or or what have you okay so before i open it up to questions i'm going to give a shameless plug for an upcoming and related event um, this was a really small sample of animal law um, in october the law school uh, in partnership with animal justice national animal uh, legal advocacy organization um, is hosting together we're hosting a national animal law conference um, we've received more submissions than we could possibly have imagined uh, from throughout canada and the world so we've gotten submissions from africa new zealand places in europe south america it's really cool um, on a wide range of interesting and diverse subjects uh, and current subjects so if I may say so myself, it's going to be fantastic. Um, anyone is welcome to attend. Registration will open in the next, uh, I would say in the next couple of months. So watch that space. Uh, we'll of course be advertising that on Twitter and Facebook and on the law school website and Animal Justice will be advertising as well. Um, so keep an eye out for that. All right, on that note, I'm happy to try to answer whatever questions I can. Thank you. Okay. And the first one is, how do you um, apply to animals that aren't um, in the sense of like strays or wild animals? Yeah. Okay, I'll answer that. Um, well, I mean, in theory, it, it applies. Uh, the, the, the prohibition on animal cruelty in the criminal code, there are separate provisions that relate specifically to uh, animal property. But the cruelty provisions are general and they are meant to apply. There is case law about an unowned cat who was uh, treated quite badly and uh, the individual there was convicted under the criminal code. Yeah. And um, the second question, has anybody ever tried or successfully managed to sue civilly for damages for the animal that's been treated cruelly? So in the sense of like, say, somebody formerly abused a cat but wasn't found guilty in a court of so the owner sued civilly and then became like a trustee. In the name of the animal, no, that did happen in the US. There was a big uh, big case about a, a horse named Justice uh, who tried to sue for his, his medical bills. They weren't successful, uh, so no. But uh, you can, of course, sue civilly for damages if someone harms your animal and you have to pay for the vet, certainly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the breed. Uh, mammal bill that's yeah. been approved. So uh, currently there's a group called the Royal Sanctuary Project yeah. who is uh, putting forth an idea of having a sanctuary yeah. for these whales. Um, so in your reading of this bill, it, only two places can have these, uh, these citations. So if, like, say, such a sanctuary was built, and it was a bigger area, uh, not for the purpose of environmental education or conservation, just not really for the public. It's just to keep these animals in a larger area suitable for their welfare until eventually um, uh, they die. Mm -hmm. They cannot be reintroduced again uh, because they were in captivity. Sure. And they have no more skills for themselves. Mm -hmm. So what's the legality around that? I would argue that they would fall under the rehabilitation exception. It's a good question. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I know about the Well Sanctuary Project. Uh, I, I, I imagine that if they do open, they'll, they'll try to work with places like uh, Marine Land and the Vancouver Aquarium to take some of the animals off their hands, especially if, if these places are not making money off the animals anymore. Yeah. Yes. Do you know why the criminal code provision says uh, animals and birds? Like, is there something special about birds? I get this question all the time. Um, the criminal code for animals was written in the late 1800s. It hasn't really changed since then, honestly. Um, the code was sort of overhauled in the 1950s, but that provision hasn't changed since then other than the sentence. So I think that there, uh, historically there were uh, differences at the level of property between animals and birds. But I also suspect, I don't have a concrete answer for this, but I suspect that it might also have to do with the uh, sophistication of the science at the time. Uh, 
Um, right now, I think we can all agree that animals are, uh, birds are animals, but uh, I don't know if that wasn't always as, if they weren't always categorized the same way. Um, I'm going to try to put this question as like publicly as possible, but it seemed to be implied that perhaps animals that we in North America would eat as food are less subject to cruelty laws, perhaps. Um, but then you see the shark fins, and those would have been used perhaps for like consumption. I'm just wondering why the why criminal code would allow for exotic animals like dolphins or sh sharks or anything like that to be sort of differentiated from companion animals or then differentiated again from animals that we would consume. Yeah, I think uh, the best answer I could give you there is that the real problem with shark finning is the method of slaughter. Okay. And we have laws on slaughter methods. So that wouldn't apply then to cow. Do you, see, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because cow is killed in a, it, or slaughtered in a more humane way. Well, that's, that's the that's the, thing. that's the whole argument. I think if someone was asked that someone in Parliament was asked to justify that distinction, that that would be the answer. Or that that's how I would distinguish anyway. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak to some of the rules around uh, the condemned or non food grade animals. Uh, well, you mean what makes them condemned or? Uh, or more so. Uh, what happens to them? Well, they're they're euthanized. Okay. Uh, so, looking at that from the cruelty perspective, well, sorry, I should correct that. There, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not an expert in uh, in slaughter methods and and that kind of thing and ag, which is why I didn't want to talk too much about that. But uh, I think that if an animal is sort of downed beyond uh, beyond uh, quality of life, they would be euthanized, uh, or or they might be they might be treated depending on on the circumstances, but. For, they're not going into the food system, at least not in that state. Yeah. Yep. I had a question about the Sandy Bay Hat case. Yep. And I'm just raising this it was based on. So when you accuse hit the cat with the burn, like you clearly would have intentionally been inflicting pain on the cat to, to you know, on it. So was the case dismissed on the basis that he, that the accused didn't willfully cause Suffering that ha that happened, or that he that he didn't know that it was unnecessary pain and suffering. If you see what I mean? I think that he would probably have argued that he was just trying to scare it. I mean, I haven't read the court transcripts, but if I were the accused, that's probably what I would argue. I didn't mean to break his leg. But he admitted that he intended contact. Or he didn't necessarily admit that he intended contact. He admitted that contact happened. So I think he was, you know, he was trying to scare it. Okay, I'm just wondering if the implication of the pain and suffering aspect is that if someone has like a 19th century view that animals might feel pain in the instant that connects, but they don't experience later. Like how people used to argue that infants who were circumcised experienced a second of pain later to suffer. Yeah. That you could get away with anything because you could say, I think willfully inflict any suffering after the initial pain. Well, that would come down to the evidence and you'd have a vet testify that yes, the animal would have experienced pain and suffering after the fact. You know, there's also a, an aspect of that case that people don't really talk about, which is the psychological trauma that the cat would have experienced. And there are questions about, uh, about where that kind of uh, suffering uh, whether it can ground criminal charges. And I don't know that it, it has yet, but I think that people are looking to, to try to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, where does an organization like the SPCA fit into the, the legal regulatory sure. architecture? Yeah, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, and this is changing, so it's a bit of a moving target in places like Ontario and Alberta, 
But in Nova Scotia, the SPCA is mandating with enforcing the criminal code and the Provincial Animal Protection Act for companion animals. So their inspectors are the ones who are investigating and seizing animals uh, who are victims of cruelty or distress. Okay, by the province to that organization. Yeah. yeah. That's changing in certain places. Uh, there's a recent decision in Ontario uh, where the Superior Court found that it uh, it's untransparent and um, not in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice under Section 7 of our Charter. Um, for those in the room who understand what that means, um, that basically that it's it's not legitimate in our legal system for uh, an unaccountable uh, nonprofit organization with no uh, not subject to police accountability legislation and access to information legislation for them to be uh, enforcing the law, um, and that was that happened in Ontario um, that. In Ontario, the SPCA was also responsible for farm animal welfare, so it's a different context. That situation is not happening here. So right now, here in Nova Scotia, the SPCA is responsible for companion animals. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, um, yeah, I'm curious about sort of a, around ownership of animals, specifically saying that the ownership is unknown, for example, stray animals, or it could be contested, such as surrendering to vet clinics, or maybe when an animal is uh, abandoned. Since I've worked with vet clinics before, there's a come up a lot, such as people who bring in stray animals, they sign the people, <coughs> but they want to take the animal home, they're like, I can't have this property of SCCA, yeah. or owners who give up their animals because they can't afford surgery, but come up with money after they've signed the form, or owners who don't respond back to the veterinarians calling them, essentially leaving animals for weeks at the vet clinics, and then show up later um, uh, past the point that you would consider them the owners to abandon the animal. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. What is your perspective? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know precisely what the law is on sort of how long one has to have abandoned their property in order to lose ownership. Uh, I mean, Homeward Bound in, in HRM is uh, mandated and paid by the city to uh, manage strays. And uh, I suspect that they have uh, some policy on stray holds three days or, or maybe a week, whatever it is. And um, after that, the animal would be free to go to a home. Um, I don't know how that inter inter interacts with any particular provincial law that uh, sets out a time limit. But I would have to assume that Hope for Wildlife would be following those rules. Yeah. Yeah. Not sorry, not Hope for Wildlife. Um, uh, homeward Bound. <laughs> sorry. Uh, you go salad to Dalhousie, Bob, and brought someone in Ontario to help them with their animals. Yeah. And I think there's three animals at the time, um, primates and dolphins, and saves me on the third one. I was wondering if, if you guys have heard anything uh, about the progress on that situation. So you're referring to the Non-Human Rights Project, and Steve Wise was the guest speaker. He's American. Um, and the third animal is elephants. <laughs> and they're still working on it. Um, and they're... They're going to be working on it until they until they win, and they're filing suits uh, with different types of animals. So it started with primates, um, and I think they have filed suit on behalf of an elephant now in Connecticut. I don't think they have done marine mammals yet. Four elephants, four elephants. Um, they got one really good set of reasons from a dissenting judge in a New York case saying this isn't nonsense and we should hear this. Um, in response to uh, a brief prepared by uh, a group of philosophers, one of whom works at Dow, and, um, and that was uh, a success. It was, uh, it's really unprecedented to hear uh, an appellate court um, acknowledge the sentience and intelligence and autonomy of these kinds of animals and say that this is something worth paying attention to. So they're riding on that. They're 
filing new suits on behalf of more and more animals until they get the result that they're looking for. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I found your presentation very informative and interesting. Thank you. Um, I would like to take advantage of having an interested audience here. You mentioned boat riding. That was some um, here in May last year at the Scotia Bank Center. They're coming back. They're back here on the second of, on the first of June, right. seven p.m. at the Scotia Bank Center. We will be having a information protest or picket six o'clock on the first of June outside the Scotia Bank Center. So if you're interested and want to show some support, please come. I have to. No, that's fine. I appreciate that. I did not know that they were coming back, so that's um, not really welcome news, but thank you for, <laughs> for notifying me. I won't be here on the 1st of June, but thank you for sharing that. Yep. Not being a law person, mm -hmm. this is a reasonable question. Sure. sure. Uh, it sounds like there's the criminal code and then there are the provincial laws. Yeah. So when something comes to trial, how is it decided? Is it two separate things or either tried under one or the other? And how's that decided? There's strategic choices that are involved in deciding whether to press charges under the criminal code or under the provincial law. So, like I mentioned, uh, it's much easier to prove uh, the offense in question under provincial law. Um, it's much harder to uh, harder to defend against. Um, so the burden of proof is different. Um, and it's harder to defend against a, a provincial offense. So that would be a strategic choice on the part of the Crown um, based on, say, the egregiousness of the crime, the characteristics of the accused, the animal in question, the context of the act. Yeah. There's going to be a big one coming up in this province from what I'm hearing on Facebook <laughs> from uh, a recent event surrounding um, some cruelty to dogs, so I'm just kind of interested to see what The Mika, is that, yeah. Uh, I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, um, I think the Crown would work in conjunction with the SPCA. Um, ultimately, the Crown would decide what, what kinds of charges to bring. Yeah. Okay. Um, some provinces have banned the breeding of certain breed, and some provinces feel very strongly that shouldn't engage in that. Um, where does that sit, and how do you do that? Um, I think provinces would be within their purview to make to make that decision. Um, animals are property. Property is uh, the legislative jurisdiction of the province. Um, I. I'd really have to think this through, but I, I wouldn't, my knee-jerk reaction is not that they cannot. That's what I Yeah, yes, that they can. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would have to think that through a bit more carefully. Yeah. Yep. Can you shed any light on um, what we're hearing about changes that are coming to effect? Provincial regulations about cruelty cases with animals? Um, well, the Animal Protection Act was amended in the fall, so I, I think those changes are in effect. What I've heard is that the, it's the meat, but it hasn't actually been enacted yet. It hasn't been proclaimed. It's been given royal assent, but as of last week, it was still on the government's thing, as it still needed to be proclaimed. Okay. So, what are, I mean, what are the changes of that? Yeah, as far as I understand, um, the changes are the grounds on which, I was just looking at this, uh, the grounds on which an SPCA inspector can enter a property, um, so they just need reasonable grounds to suspect that an animal is in distress, um, which is one of the things that people had issues with when the bill was being debated. And uh, I don't want to say the wrong thing, I'm pretty sure it's reasonable grounds, but it's a lower threshold. I think, than it was under the previous law. And also there are um, specific actions and practices that are prohibited in the new law that were not expressly prohibited 
um, in the previous version, such as, well, declawing. Um, so cosmetic surgeries performed solely for the purpose of altering the appearance of an animal without a medical benefit, um, including, uh, so including means it's not an exhaustive list, tail docking, tail nicking, setting or blocking, ear cropping, uh, devocalizing or debarking, uh, declawing, onychectomy, de uh, declaw removal, or any other prescribed alteration or surgery. But uh, that doesn't cover uh, agricultural practices carried out in accordance with the, uh, the codes of practice that I mentioned. So it's just for companion animals. Uh, so I think those are the major changes in there. How does that interact with, say, spay neuter policies? I mean, you'd argue that spay neuter is necessary. Why? It's <laughs> just like an accepted medical procedure in the interests of, of the species and the public. I think. Okay, so it's, so it's for, for our benefit, because if we're talking about like, the actual well-being of the animal in question, like my understanding is that the scientific evidence actually shows that it's beneficial to not alter or to at least delay altering the animal until after it's finished growing. Yeah. Um, I think there's lots of contradictory science on that. There are a lot of vets who will, will do a pediatric spay-neuter. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, the law as it affects animals primarily serves human interests. Um, so the law is improving and things like these uh, prohibited practices, for example, are, are good, you know, for the animals. Um, but uh, controlling the pet population, there's a human interest in doing that as well. And I think that a lot of people would argue that it's to the advantage of animals as well, that they shouldn't be homeless and stray and, you know, feral cats and that kind of thing. Yeah. But it would be accepted as an accepted medical practice, done humanely under anesthetic, of course. Yeah. I have sort of a two prong question, and I think it's written more this leopard print sweater today. I'm so sorry. Oh, <laughs> and it was substantial. I quite love animals. But I was wondering about two things. The uh, entertainment industry, I have not seen the Dumbo movie, but there is a little trailer where the, you know, the mother and the child are separated. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the influence of the entertainment industry. And then the other part of my question was more about fashion. And how fashion is influencing animal protection now for coats and not so much the mm -hmm. norm as they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, um, the entertainment stuff. You know, most of those films now are using computer-generated imaging, so it's not really a question of um, animal um, abuse, although that still happens. Um, I mean, I. You know, as small children, we, we watch movies with animals in them and we grow to love animals. So I think that's probably a good thing. Um, and uh, fashion, uh, we're evolving as a society in terms of what we consider acceptable and not acceptable. And there are jurisdictions that have banned fur. New York is talking about a ban on fur. Uh, I think LA has banned fur. Um, it, it's just. It's no, no, it's not, you know, there are certain people who don't think it's unacceptable, but it's just no longer um, uncontroversial, right? People are starting to, to realize that some of these practices that we've taken for granted for decades and centuries are maybe not okay. And again, change is slow. The law is slow to reflect those societal changes, but they, they are happening. And I would say the same is true for food. More and more sort of plant-based restaurants are opening. People are starting to have a more open mind about what they eat and where they spend their money. People who eat meat are, are becoming more aware and more sensitive to, again, to how the animals are treated before they're sent to slaughter. So yeah, I think things are, are changing and it's positive. So sure, a lot of the stuff I said here was grim, but you know, in the long term, things are changing in positive ways. The only exception to that might be the new Canada Goose, so, you know, clothing sure. line has really ex exponentially developed in Europe, but yeah. that's the one that yeah. they are using for, for trim. Yeah, yeah. there's always a question. I know. Okay. Yeah, you can protest.
not buy shares. That's right. right. Yeah. Yep. Do you have any interesting cases where property or cruelty law has interacted with treaty law? Um, it's a good question. Um, not really. Uh, I don't know of any cases. No. So I think we technically have till 8.30, but we're not forced to stay till 8.30. So <laughs> if nobody has any questions, do you, are there, you can just go at the back, yeah. How does the law deal with the situation where an animal, where there's a dispute between ownership? Like, say, if somebody's cat gets out, somebody down the road kicks in the cat and then refuses to return. <laughs> if it got to court, if it, it would be a question of evidence and who the judge believes, like, like all disputes. Uh, as a law, as a lawyer, isn't the rule uh, find his keepers until the true owner comes along? So if the person who truly owns the cat can prove the owner the cat, they have the ownership rights. I, I don't teach property law, and <laughs> I remember that was Peter uh, Peter Darby that was teaching here years ago. Right, that was his one of his first rules. I remember that one. Perhaps, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, but it would it would depend on on the facts and on the context and and on on the evidence, really. Yeah. Question over here. Uh, yes. Um, it's been a long time since I, I looked at it, but why are the elections decided by the initial prohibitions on like animal cruelty and neglect in the criminal code weren't really based on um, protecting the animals per se, but on the idea that we can't let people sadistic things because then, to animals because then they're more likely to do sadistic things to children and other kind of people. Certainly. So it's more about protecting the general uh, human population, not the animal itself. Has the kind of language that Parliament uses in, in discussing them using bills and any other kind of amendments shifted towards let's protect the animal as opposed to the public? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, the bestiality bill, for example, is a response to the idea that animals' consideration are not are not currently taken into account. Certainly, there is some like ick factor and morality talk there too. Um, but when uh, I would I would say that yes, the the language of the debates has shifted, and legislators are and courts again are t taking this more seriously than historically. Yeah, the language of the law that has not changed. The criminal code, but uh, our thinking around it is is changing. Yeah. Do you see the labeling of the animals as property ever changing? That's uh, the uh, non human rights project. Um, the case trying to get personhood for certain species. That's their objective. Um, I would love to see that succeed. Uh, I think it's it's a it's a it's a long it's a long road, but I think there are a lot of people who would be quite happy to see that change happen. At the same time, there's uh, not surprisingly a lot of resistance to that idea because of what it means for industries that depend on animals and use animals for profit. Yeah. Um, I'm curious um, whether there are any. Countries, jurisdictions that um, ascribe rights to animals. In some parts of the world, uh, recognizing that certain rivers yeah. and uh, ecological features have rights. I'm just wondering if that's. Uh, some more recent constitutions and bills of rights might include uh, rights for animals, but I don't want to pronounce on any one specifically. I'm not entirely sure. But yes, there are jurisdictions that uh, are much more amenable to that than ours. Yeah. So, so does that rule well then? I mean, you mentioned earlier references made to decisions made in Europe and elsewhere. So if that starts emerging other sure. parts, then it could be yeah. the basis for decisions here. The context is different, but any little bit helps. Any, you know, if you can point to a jurisdiction that's doing something differently, um, why wouldn't you? You know, as an example of something else, something that we might adopt, certainly. Yeah. Unless it affects business, like in the sense of 10 million chicks. Uh, Jeremy. <laughs> 
any constitutional challenges to provincial legislation that like does these prohibitions and penalties what seems to be for all purposes? Uh, yes. <laughs> If the, uh, it's really interesting. Um, in the case about the SPCA and the uh, accountability question in Ontario recently, um, the claimant there also challenged the constitutionality or the constitutional validity of uh, provincial animal protection law, uh, saying that the uh, because the federal government has jurisdiction over criminal law, that provinces can't adopt that kind of law, that argument was dismissed. But, uh, but yeah, and the <coughs> government of Ontario is appealing that decision. I'm not sure on which grounds, like I don't know if it's only on uh, the charter issue and the principles of fundamental justice or if it's also on the division of powers question, but uh, that is not done yet. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm just curious if, to your knowledge, there are any studies that are made publicly available regarding the um, amount of time that animals are allowed to be transported without food, water, or rest. Or where is this information coming from that you know that these amounts of time are suitable for their survival and well-being? It's the science relied on by the CFIA. I mean, you'd have to go on their website and, and see. They're uh, a government organization, so... So the I, government, this, these studies are government-funded? Uh, no, not necessarily. No, it's the science that they're relying on. Okay. Um, but because they're a government uh, organization, um, that information should be available to, to citizens. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all very much for being here. Thank <laughs> you.